Welcome, welcome to Quarantine with Styles, aka Driving with Styles. Happy Juneteenth, happy Friday. Appreciate you guys taking out time to join me for these 30 minutes. As usual, you can tweet me at vstyles17. Or you can click on the, uh, the link in my bio to join live. Up to you. I'm here. And I have my Twitter feed up and running. So if you tweet at vstyle17, I'll be able to see it. And you can ask a question. Tell me how you feel. If you want to question what I'm saying. Or you have something that you just want to say, get off your chest. So. I had to make an executive a decision today. I was, I just got a notification on my phone from Krispy Kreme that the hot donut sign was on. And I don't know if you, you guys would know, you're not in Baton Rouge. Well, Baton Rouge, we have one Krispy Kreme. And they renovated and they haven't been open for a while. They opened about a few weeks ago. And I haven't had a Krispy Kreme. I probably don't need one. You can see, you can see all this right here. I probably don't need one. But man, I can't. After this show is over, I'm heading in the car. I'm gonna get me, a, get me and the family a, a Juneteenth treat. So my my cup is full today, man. If you guys don't follow Anthony White and myself, we do a a live broadcast every Tuesday, and Thursday from. 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And yesterday we were blessed to have Coach Kerr join us on the broadcast, which was, I'm still I'm still shocked that he agreed to it. It was a crazy whim on Twitter. Invite him. He said yes. Got some got some guys together and we had a great time. I'm gonna tell you. There's, I, there's so much to say. I'm, I'm still floating right now. Haven't seen him since the Tennessee game in 96. And still looks great. Still strikes that, <laughs> still strikes that fear in your heart a little bit because of a re respect that you have for him. And if you had a chance to watch the episode and, and heard some of the, the things that the guys had to say about him. You will understand how great a man he is. And, and it's unfortunate that we live in a time in athletics where wins and losses are the bottom line. It, it really is. I, I think your guys, old school guys, even though there's some pros and cons with old school guys, but with their history of practicing. Practice were crazy before some things NCAA changed. But a lot of coaches got into a lot of old coaches got into coaching for the right reason. And that was to develop young males into young men. And some of us didn't take on to the teachings in college. Some of us did, but after college, we definitely realized exactly what Coach Curry was trying to teach us. And there were some poignant moments last night. Craig Yee said some, some things. Everybody says some things, and the one that sticks out to me the most right now is my man Reggie Russ <laughs> told Coach that he didn't enjoy his time at UK. But the person that made the time at UK fun or uh, great was Coach Curry and his teachings. And that says a lot about a coach because I'm going to tell you something. Coaching a hundred male has to be hair pulling. I I coached well, I started coaching nine year old boys to last year, so they were thirteen. 
And I only had 10 basketball players, and I was pulling my hair out. And I had great parents. They supported me throughout the whole process. But man, I can't imagine dealing with 118 to 22, 23-year-old males and coming out the other end and enjoying it. That shows a lot about the coaches that we had. And I'm glad that uh, Coach Curry had some of the things he said. And, and the thing that stuck out to me with a uh, many things he said, but one thing that made me feel great as a former player and team captain on that last team was how he appreciated how we finished that year for him. Like he said, we could have easily packed it in after he was terminated, but we had, we went on a three game winning streak. And for him, now I see it meant a lot, but for me, it was frustrating and frustrating as a team captain. As a team captain, I can't, <laughs> I know some of my teammates were, were highly upset with me because I had BJ and I, Billy Jack and I had quite a bit of team meetings. And it frustrates me because once coach got fired, I don't know why, I, I, I have guesses, maybe trying to be on the good side of the next coaching staff, getting some good film out, I'm not sure. But those last three games were the most focused we have, we have been in a long time at UK since probably my freshman year. And we didn't beat any slouches. We, I mean, we beat Mississippi State, we beat Georgia, and we just happened to beat Vandy. But don't sleep on Vandy because I think I only beat Vandy one time. And that was the one year we beat them. That 93 year we went to the Peach Bowl and we was at five wins. I only needed one win to get bowl eligible. First time in nine years, nine or ten years. And we lost that game. So it frustrates me and it still frustrates me to this day that we had the talent. And unfortunately, we didn't show it until those last four games. It's, Coach Curry has impacted a lot of people. And it's a blessing to still have him with us, to be able to give some of his wisdom last night, to, for us as players, to show our love for him because it's, it's, it's unfortunate that a lot of people don't know is once that Tennessee game ended, we all dispersed. I, like I said, I haven't seen him since he gave that speech after the game at Tennessee. That was the last time I seen him. And that's partly my fault. I should have done a better job of keeping in touch. And that's the last time I saw some of my teammates. And it's, it's, and it's weird how football terminates when, you, when your eligibility is up. Now, back in those days, we didn't have the social media that we have now where you can, and the technology where you can probably FaceTime and you can Zoom meeting like we did last night and communicate with your former teammates. We didn't have that when I graduated. And like I say, we lost contact with a lot of people. Once, once that man, once that ended, it was finito. It was done. And since Coach Curry was fired, I'm sure I don't know how long it, what time it took him to clear out, but it that still hurts me, knowing that I was on that team, his final team at UK. Like I said, I'm, I'm glad if. I don't want to say it was closure, but in an essence, it's well a little sense of closure that he really appreciated us finishing that season. And it was closure for, for me to show him how much we appreciated him. 
And I'm not sure. I know there are some players that have asked for us to have it again. We will see. That's a possibility. I'm not sure, but we will see. Technology now gives us the ability to connect with so many people, and we probably need to take a better advantage of that. Next thing I want to talk about is I saw this article, and it touched me very much. Uh, the Marquise Goodwin article in ESPN. Guys, I think it's a, it is a must-read. It was a really good article. And I've, I've said this many times. It's unfortunate that we don't get a chance to see or understand the true lives of professional athletes, college athletes in general, not just professional, all athletes. We only see them on game day. We don't see them, what they go through in practice. More importantly, we don't see what they go through in their real life. And to have Marquise Goodwin and his wife Morgan go through multiple miscarriages. And when you read the stories, she, has a, she had a situation with a cervix something that prevented her from carrying her her baby to full term. And with technology, they they found a way to stop their surgery and, and they eventually had one. But all these miscarriages happen in the season. And some of the fans came down on him because they said he was soft. They said he wasn't dedicated. Without understanding what was truly going on in his life personally, and if you don't understand that personal life carries over to your performance, to your ability to to perform and practice in games. And it's very unfortunate that he had to go through that because he had one miscarriage, and I'm not sure if anybody remember the game. I can't remember what the, I can't remember who the four announcers were playing, but he caught a post pattern. Might have been Seattle or the Ravens, one of them. And he scored and he went to his knees and you can see him balling. All his teammates reacted. That's because the night before he lost his first baby. And I think a year or so later, they again had a miscarriage and they lost twins. And that all was compounded with the fact that he had some injuries and for right now let's kind of put them on a back burner which that's that's the business of the, of the sport they they have to move on you injured they got to bring more people then the next year they brought in they drafted Debo and they brought in Emmanuel Sanders he got deeper deeper in the, in the depth chart and like he said he got into a, a dark place and add on to that your reaction to the fans because fans just think I, it, it's amazing to me how I guess fans just think that athletes are just not human. We have feelings, we have things that affect us that can affect our performance. It, it just it's just human nature. Like in college, I mean, you can have you can have a bad test, you come in and have a bad practice. And you have a bad practice, I mean, you probably have going to have a bad game. Or there's situations happen at home when you're not a local kid. I had a situation at home that affected me. And you're not at home. You can't get home for many reasons. And it, it has a big impact on you for at least that day, next day. It depends. It can linger. It can linger to the game. It can, it can linger for a practice or two. Unfortunately, fans don't get insight into those situations because it is personal. But there is a point where I think sometimes fans have to realize that athletes are human. They are doing their best. They are trying their best. I'll, I'll tell you something. 
the majority of them are giving their all for your own scholarship. If you don't perform, you have a chance to lose that scholarship because it's an annual renewable scholarship. So no one is 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 just going to lay it down because they they know or we know that it can be taken away. And then some for some, if it's taken away, that's your that's your chance of going to college and getting a scholar and, and getting a degree. Not every athlete is a five star athlete who has who pretty much know that they're going to play on Sundays. The majority of the athletes know that this is their vehicle to getting a degree that some wouldn't be able to get and to eliminate the fact of having uh, student debt. Taking advantage of your, your skill set and your God, your God-given gift. I just wish that fans would relax sometimes it, it, it amazes me right now speaking of relaxing that we want football and sports so bad that we can potentially sacrifice these young kids life we don't know who to say what happens to these kids six years later if they have it or they asymptomatic or whatever the case is we don't know what the ramifications will be. We just don't know. We don't have the information. And if you think you have the information, you don't. This is something that's it's new. Yes, there's some people who can carry on with their lives, but we don't know what's going to happen two years down the road. It could impact their lung capacity. It could, there's a lot of things that could impact. It's amazing to me that we are willing to sacrifice athletes' life, which are not essential. This Athletics is not essential. Not even close to being essential. All right, I'm, I'm going to get off of that because I can stay on that for a while. The next thing I saw today, and I was going back and forth how I was going to do this, but I have to air the whole thing. This is, and this is going to take the place of my video today. So it's going to be a long, long, I think it's four minutes of it. But watching Ryan Clark this morning on Get Up, talking about his son and the incident that he had at a Whataburger, it's something that I, I want to say all because I don't know all. I know the majority of black fathers feel this way. And it's unfortunate. I felt like I felt I wish I really knew Ryan. Um, but this hurt my heart. And take a listen, give you a little insight to sometimes being a black father. Well, I think um you initially, the first thing is, you know, as a black man and the father of a black young man, I'm happy he's alive, period. That, that was, that was my, my first thought. And then that immediately turned to anger. And what's crazy is I wasn't mad at the young lady or the woman. I wasn't mad at the manager. I was mad at myself. I was mad with Jordan. And I'm not necessarily sure that that's the right emotion to have, but nothing pisses me off more than being scared. And even though I knew the moment was over, I was still in that moment as his dad. I was still picturing, as I'm reading it, I'm still picturing, picturing what's going on and I'm playing out other scenarios in my mind. I'm playing out a scenario of if this woman would have had a weapon and she could easily say that these three young black men were threatening her. One of Jordan's friends is a tight end. He's extremely tall. He's a thicker kid. And I believe that if that woman pulls a gun on those young men and if that woman pulls the trigger, I believe that she's never punished. I believe that justice is never served. And even if justice is served, it's not enough to bring my son back. But this isn't just a fear for me every day. This has been a fear for black people forever. My father called me to check on me last night. He obviously called Jordan the day before. And there's a story my dad has been telling around me forever. And we actually laughed at it. And it takes on new meaning for me. When 19, 1977, uh, my father was at a fast food restaurant. Uh, 
with his girlfriend. His girlfriend at the time, and I know we're trying to get rid of colorism, was a fairer skinned woman, but she was black. But to the white guys in there, she was a white girl. And so they start harassing him and they're using racial slurs and calling him an N word. And so they attempt to jump my father. And so he jumps behind the counter and he's looking for something to protect himself with, but it's a restaurant. All they had was plastic utensils. And we would laugh about that story and laugh about that story. But he said, he said, I never thought that this many years later, my grandson would be experiencing the same racism that I did. And so where we are in a point to where people are starting to listen, where people are starting to understand who didn't understand before, I believe that the true racists, the people with true hate in their heart, are starting to feel a little bit of the power that they felt over the last few years slip away. So they're going to double down on their racism. They're going to double down on their hate. They're going to double down on their evil. And that's what this woman did. And at the end of Jordan's statement, he kind of lists some of the things that he thought about himself and said to this woman, I was none of those things. His entire life, he has grown up as my son. And it was my job to put him in better situations than my parents could put me. So he grew up in very affluent areas. He went to schools that were predominantly white because those were the schools that I felt could give him the best opportunity to succeed. But he was always treated as Ryan Clark's son. And he's faced racism and he's heard the word, but it never affected him in this way. And I felt like I didn't prepare him for this situation enough. To know as a black man, you can't walk up to cars. You can't wave down cars with white people in it because your life is not of value to all of them. And so um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed that my child is still here. I, um, like, if something would have happened to him, it would have broke me. And so for me, I got to do a, a better job of, 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 of educating him and I got to protect him. Because cause I, I wouldn't know how to live if he wouldn't have made it out. And so thank you for everybody that reached out to me. And um, like I know it's getting better, but it's not better, better yet and better for everybody. And um, you know, like we just gotta keep, you know, staying together, man, and just doing what we can. Man, that that was tough to watch. And having a 14-year-old son, I definitely understand where he's coming from. And it's sad that Ryan had to be upset with himself at this time. That's The kid didn't do anything wrong. And like TV, like Terry Brown and I said, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, had a broadcast TV with me. And how it was like my father had to have that talk with me about just make sure you get home. Don't I don't care whatever happens. I don't care whose fault it is. I don't care the situation. Just make sure you get home. And I didn't understand that really being naive as Ryan Clark said. My parents tried to get me into school. Not tried. They got me into a school that was gonna give me a better chance to succeed. And even with that, it was still the fear of things can happen. Make sure you just get home. Make sure you protect yourself. Make sure you get home so then when you get home, we can handle the situation as adults. And to hear the story about his father, to hear the story, I know the school that Ryan and this kid too, a great school, but that doesn't insulate you. It's hard as a parent, you want to always insulate your kid because my son is a great athlete. He's a great track guy. He's, he's his age group national champion in the pentathlon. And I, he feels like, like what I say to him is just not gonna happen. And I wish it doesn't. I hope it doesn't. But we can't guarantee anything. And he had, he actually had, he was called an N-word at school. And we had to have that talk. And it was eye-opening. Because like 
we think that we have gone beyond that and unfortunately we have not gone beyond that we still got a long way to go like coach curry said he he said that they didn't capitalize and make the necessary take the necessary stuff to make the change well my generation didn't either now i really do feel like this current generation has a better chance of making that next step and i hope that my kids kids or i guess maybe my grandkids or if i'm here long enough my great grandkids would have we have a chance to really live the true american dream And it was very, it was difficult hearing that, man. I wish I could step through the screen and give a man Ryan Clark a hug because we all feel that. Being fathers, of, especially fathers of, of black males. I'm going to touch on this real quick. Saw some news today. UCLA athletes asking for a independent guy, person, individual to be their voice basically for going through this COVID-19 situation, getting these athletes back on campus. Because if, like if you heard, haven't seen, Clemson had 23 guys that, text, that tested positive after te uh, Texas had their guy. It's some, it's some, some tough times guys. And I, and I think these guys are understanding how important they are to the livelihood of these institutions because we are playing, like Coach Gundy said, to run this money through the state. An amount of money is more than just the institution. I think we need to get past that too. College football has an impact on the economy of that city, which therefore then goes to the state. We're talking about hotels, we're talking airline travel, we're talking about restaurants, we're talking about everything. And it's unfortunate that it's, that it's on the backs of these student athletes. But that's just how it is. And I commend those guys for, for again, like the Tennessee, like the Texas guys did when they wrote down their, what their needs and their requests were commend these UCLA guys for doing the same thing. It's commendable because they understand the importance. It's not just, we're just going to play because we are scared to lose our scholarship. Guys, I appreciate you watching. Again, outro. <laughs> it's going to be my DB highlights from high school, not as I was showing earlier, for a couple weeks, I was showing my quarterback stuff. I'm going to show my DB highlights. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Have a great Father's Day weekend. Appreciate the men in your life. And I will see you guys on Monday. One sixteen left play the game. Quarterback drops it.